about a spoken corpus of Cameroon Pidgin English, compilation, applications and next steps. So what we'd like to do is to just give you an overview of a project that we've been working on for about five years now, um, and which is not over yet. Okay. Uh, here's an outline of our presentation. So first of all, we'll give you, it's, it's in two main parts with a short third part. Um, we'll begin with an overview of the project, telling you a bit about the language, Cameroon Pidgin English, uh, the research context, so what was out there and available when we began this project, um, the objectives of our project and the research team, um, and then we'll tell you about a pre-pilot course we did, and then the pilot corpus, which is the main project we're talking about today. Um, and to make it uh, a bit more linguistically, we also decided to um, introduce briefly some case studies of research, linguistic research that we've been able to do with this relatively small corpus um, and uh, illustrate the range of applications that are possible with a small corpus of this size. Um, and then finally, we'll briefly outline our plans for the next stage of our project, which is to apply for funding for a one million word. Okay, so beginning with some information about the language, as you may well know, Cameroon Pidgin English is an expanded Pidgin Creole spoken in some form by roughly half of Cameroon's population. That's an estimate from Ethnologue. Um, it may be a good estimate, um, but we need to emphasise that in some form means that the ways in which people use this language varies hugely from across the continuum from Creole to Pidgin. So some speakers, the minority I would say, are speaking Cameroon Pidgin English as a Creole. They've learned the language during childhood, they use it regularly in their daily lives and, their home and so on. At the other end, the extreme end of the continuum, some people are using it as a second language in very limited social contexts, perhaps for purposes of trade, for example. Um, and everything in between. The um, Cameroon Pidgin English, or CPE as we call it, is spoken primarily in the Anglophone West regions of Cameroon, and we'll show you a map in a minute, but also it's widely used in urban centres throughout the country. Um, and as a predominantly spoken language, it has no standardised orthography. Um, one of our big challenges in this project was to come up with a means of uh, presenting the language in written form, which was quite a, a challenging challenge, actually. Um, uh, the language, however, enjoys a vigorous oral tradition, not least through its presence in the broadcast media. So there are lots and lots of private radio stations that you can tune into, some of them online, and listen to the language <coughs> being spoken. Um, Pidgin has a stigmatised status in Cameroon in the face of French and English, which are the prestige official languages of Cameroon. Um, and these languages also coexist with an estimated 280 indigenous languages. So Cameroon is, strictly speaking, a bilingual country. Um, French and English are the official languages. But as I'm sure you've seen in the news, there's uh, a lot of unrest in Cameroon presently um, because the Anglophone community feels um, marginalised and, in fact, represents a minority. So um, to say it's a bilingual country is a bit misleading, I would say. The majority language is French. Okay? And the reason why you see pidgin spread throughout the urban centres across Cameroon is precisely because of the linguistic complexity. Okay, so at the time when we came to start this project, and this project being um, trying to think about how to build a corpus of this spoken variety, um, there was very little available out there that we could call comparable as, uh, in terms of databases of, of language. Um, there's a corpus of Cameroon English, which has been under construction since 1994, um, but this is not freely available. It's actually the case that we had to track it down. We went to a conference, I think it was ICAM, wasn't it? And uh, one of the guys there said, oh yeah, I've got the files in my garage. <laughs> so we, we managed to get hold of it, but it's not easy to get hold of. Um, and it's not quite finished, but that's uh, focused on written standard Cameroon in English, so not pidgin. Um, and it has about 800,000 words of various, from various sources, as you can see there. 
Okay, so that was something. Um, there's the International Corpus of English project, which I'm sure some of you are well aware of, which has been running since 1996. Um, again, that focuses on standard regional varieties of English, not pigeons and cream. Um, Ice Nigeria, which is the closest we've got to Cameroon in that project, was released in 2014. There's a corpus of written British Creole from 1999, that's Mark Sever's project, that's very small. Um, there's the Atlas of Pigeon and Creole Language Structures, not a corpus, of course, but uh, an encyclopedic database of information about Pigeon and Creole languages, which is uh, really useful for when you're starting to think about research on these languages and what sorts of questions you should be asking. However, as we'll see a bit later in our presentation, um, the information in those databases, this one's built along the same lines as the World Atlas of Language Structures, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, the, the information in those databases is often patchy and unreliable because of the um, limitations on the sources for languages very often. So in APIX, for example, they rely on a um, questionnaire from a language specialist working together with maybe one language consultant. And sometimes there are gaps in the data, or sometimes the data is not quite reliable. Okay. <clears throat> and then the last one, this is the project currently that's most comparable to what we're trying to achieve here. This is the Niger Sinkor project, which um, I've come to know about through Bernard Caron, who's at um, CNRS Paris. Um, and Well, he's based in Nigeria, actually, but Paris is where I most mm -hmm. often see him. Um, and this is a project to build a corpus of Nigerian pigeon English, um, which speakers refer to as Niger. Um, and that's built along quite similar lines to our corpus project. Um, they're aiming, well it's just under construction at the moment, they're aiming for half a million words, um, both spoken and written, um, data collected from eight different locations, and they aim to uh, perform a deep annotation, we'll learn more about these things, um, on 100,000 words. Okay, so that's the research context, and really when we started this project, we were pretty much in the dark in terms of, and there wasn't a model we could use that we could then easily interpret for our own purposes. Um, yeah, so we set out to do this um, with a couple of, well, three main objectives in mind. One, piloting data collection and annotation with a view to in the longer term building a bigger corpus, because we knew that we would have to do a pilot project in order to have a realistic idea about the costs involved and the time involved in building a bigger database. Okay? It's also, meanwhile, I was working on a documentation project together with Miriam Iafor to write this lovely book, which was recently published. Very proud of that book. Um, and Meanwhile, also, we, we had in mind, as we went along, that we wanted to come up with some sort of open access resource that would be useful to linguists from all sorts of different backgrounds and all sorts of different research questions. So I'm mostly interested in the grammatical aspects of the language, that's my background, but we wanted to design it in such a way that um, people with um, interest in phonetics and phonology could use the material, people with interest in sociolinguistics or Lexis is a bit tricky with a, such a small corpus, but to an extent it would be used. Okay, so those are our objectives, and with that in mind we put together our research team, which consists of me and Gabriel, standing before you now, and Miriam Ayafor, who's based in Yaoundé, in the English department there. And Miriam's also a native speaker of Cameroon Pigeon English, which is essential for us in this project. And Sarah Fitzgerald, she's currently a PhD student at Sussex, and she was our research assistant on the project. Okay, so before we started on the pilot, we did a pre-pilot, a pilot for the pilot. <laughs> I'm all about the pilots. Um, and this one, uh, one year, I had a small research budget at Sussex for being head of department. They gave me £2,000, thanks. Um, and I decided to spend it on this. So I, I wired the money to Cameroon, and uh, the plan was to see how much data Miriam could get. Um, she's based in Cameroon, as I said, and to get transcribed within that budget, including we spent it on a Zoom recorder. Okay, but there weren't any real costs or overheads for that project. 
We managed to get 15 hours recording, mostly from Bamenda and Yaoundé, um, and they were unstructured interviews, monologues, dialogues, and some radio recordings, uh, with some limited participant data. We came up with 120,000 words, which was transcribed, but not annotated in any way. Now, what that allowed us to do then was to figure out the costings and the timings for a funded project. Um, it allowed us to think about the development of a transcription-based orthography, which, as I mentioned before, was not easy. Um, I'm still not quite happy with the orthography system that we're using, but it's fit for purpose, let's say. Um, and although this was a convenient, based on a convenient sample, it provided a pretty robust testbed for preliminary linguistic hypotheses. So while I was working on the grammar project, I managed to extract a lot of information from this very small data set about grammatical constructions, grammatical patterns. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is where I come in um, to do the pilot study. So moving from the pre-pilot, uh, which was uh, an interesting test, but you know a bit haphazard. You know, let's see what we can get and throw everything um, at a big uh, text file. Um, well, the idea was to try and collect data from different regions, from different speakers, uh, uh, targeting different genres, different uh, areas, um, looking at um, public public uses of language, private uses of language, uh, monologues, dialogues, uh, language that has been uh, pre prepared, uh, as it were in the case of sermons, uh, and other languages that were sort of, you know, uh, other uses of language that were, you know, improvised uh, on the spot. So uh, it was a bit more carefully designed in order to make the uh, data set uh, representative. So we ended up with about 30 hours recording, uh, which uh, uh, were collected from five different locations, two in the Anglophone region, there's a map coming up, uh, and three in the Francophone region of uh, Cameroon. Uh, we ended up, as I said, with 80 texts uh, of about 3,000 words or 15 minutes. Uh, the recordings are uh, available, as well as the transcripts uh, from uh, this uh, address there. The proportions of uh, private dialogue, public dialogue, monologue, and uh, scripted and unscripted are uh, guided by the International Corpus of English project again, uh, uh, which was put together in one, you know, a group by Nelson back in, uh, in the early 90s. Uh, the idea is uh, once again to make the corpus compatible. Mm -hmm. Directly compatible, that's a bit of an article of faith, but uh, at least compatible with existing varieties. Um, what we did with the uh, um, recorders is transcribe them and then add markup. So a first layer of annotation, as well as parts of speech tagging uh, as a second layer of annotation. In the corpus files, uh, which you can download from here, um, and, and this is quite crucial, this is publicly available for free. Right? We didn't want to be the corpus that was sitting in someone's garage. <laughs> um, so um, we, we got the sound files and, you know, to different uh, uh, levels of uh, detail, we can do the MP3 one for quick and dirty work, and WAV files uh, as well for more detailed uh, information. We got the raw uh, transcripts with annotation uh, as well, so two different types of um, uh, annotation provided. We provided uh, participant metadata, more or less, more of this in a minute, um, as well as a field manual, a tagging manual, and a list of um, spellings. Um, Map. Yep, so this shows the recording locations. This map on the right is a blown up version of the bit on the west there. So that Anglophone region to the west of Cameroon and then the rest is Francophone. Um, so we had two recording locations in the Anglophone region, Bamenda and Kumba, and then three in the Francophone region, Douala, Yaoundé and Bertua, you can see there, which is more to the east. Um, we, when we designed the project, we originally hoped to be able to gather data from further north. Um, we were looking at Ngaoundere as an option, um, but it, the situation there with Boko Haram and so on was already quite dangerous for the researchers to travel to those regions. So we, we're basically limited to these areas um, because of the political situation in Cameroon. And currently with the language riots and so on, the area 
in which it's safe to travel is even smaller than it was then. So we're advised to stay clear of the border regions all the way around the country and most of this western part of the Anglophone region currently. Okay. Um, okay, back to uh, the Heidel Corpus. Um, so much as we uh, uh, use the International Corpus of English uh, project as a um, uh, uh, benchmark for uh, the uh, yeah guiding our uh, the proportion of texts that we got. We also use uh, eyes to come up with the same uh, markup. Uh, markup symbols. I'm going to show them to you later. Identify um, you know the, the speakers. Uh, identify um, utter utterance numbers. And, um, yeah, identify instances of overlapping speech in case of you're interested in conversation analysis. Um, identify instances where the transcriber is uncertain about what the actual word uttered was. Um, and also um, has uh, um, particular codes to identify foreign words and indigenous uh, words in keeping with uh, eyes. Uh, this is you know, not without its challenges, really. I mean, this is coming on page in English, well, so a type of English, a medium would say it's E is for English. Uh, it's, just, um, it's, it's pitching, but it's English as well. Uh, but then again, um, how can uh, a transcriber decide about this particular word? It's actually pitching, or it's actually English? Um, we had to rely on the transcriber intuition, really, and the criterion that uh, was applied was largely if the transcriber believed that that word would be unknown to the majority of CPE speakers, then that was tagged as uh, uh, foreign. Mm -hmm. uh, so foreign would be uh, a use of a, an English word that is used instead of the, uh, the, the local, uh, the alternative pidgin variety of the same concept. Indigenous words are a lot uh, more uh, straightforward. Um, these markup symbols are searchable, so they allow for a quick automatic retrieval. Uh, when it comes to part of speech tagging, we use a version of the clause uh, taxa, which is the one that uh, has been used to tag the English national corpus as well. So again, uh, allow more possibilities for comparison. And we uh, started using the an automatic tagger, uh, which is uh, essentially uh, trained, uh, originally uh, designed to um, tag uh, written um, standard English. Uh, we managed to tag through trial and error and training and, and retraining. Um, we managed to tag a pidgin, so a non-standard uh, uh, variety, um, which is also spoken, uh, and we managed to get it up to 94% uh, accuracy rate, which, uh, you know, I'm quite a good job um, about. Um, the part of speech tagging uh, is quite useful to um, address issues of multifunctionality, which are, you know, quite typical of these um, varieties. So, you know, the, the case in point would be, for instance, fo, which is the most frequent word uh, in our corpus, uh, and can be used both as a preposition or as the preposition, because you know, a pigeon only has, you know, well, as it's one the of the main preposition, the main preposition yeah. yes. Or it can work as an infinity marker, as a uh, two, uh, for instance, to do. Um, a little bit more uh, about this. This is what the uh, corpus would look like. This is the raw text. Uh, this code is the text identifier. So this was recorded from Bamenda. Uh, it's a private dialogue. Uh, and this is the speaker uh, identified. So it tells us it's speaker one, uh, who is an anglophone, mm, uh, it's male, and B, uh, it's a particular age group. Mm, so it's from the, uh, uh, well, I'll show it to you uh, in a little while. Right, so just by looking at these, you've got a lot of information instantly available. Um, this is, uh, for instance, the way um, uh, that uh, sentence was uh, transcribed, right? That, um, that money is unlucky when it comes to uh, the timber business. Um, here you can get an idea of the orthographic spelling uh, and uh, how this was done. With uh, a bit of markup, um, uh, we noticed that that word 
uh, is actually from French. And this is coded uh, as such. Um, and the example below shows it from the same text, from the same speaker, right, as well, uh, is uh, code switching but using uh, a local uh, language, uh, the place where they grow vegetables. Um, a third layer uh, of annotation is when we have the tagging. Mm -hmm. And this is done automatically. And you can see that the same words that you find here are sort of joined by means of an underscore uh, with three code, three letter code mm -hmm. that indicates the type of word that it belongs to. So that is a determiner, man is a uh, um, common noun in the singular, get is a verb, um, fo is a preposition, Site, it's uh, another noun, and uh, so on and so forth. Now, notice that uh, here it's very easy to read, and this is the annotation is sort of swallowing, as it were, the text. We're providing both types of uh, files, right? So, there's raw, uh, readable files for those interested in the content and the language, and also uh, tagging the tag files for those. Uh, interested in retrieving uh, information uh, and annotation that has been uh, added to. Um, other type of information that we've added is uh, to the corpus and it's uh, searchable as well as participant information which contains among other things the gender of the speaker, the age of the speaker, the ethnic group of the speaker. This is largely to do with you know, the, the language is spoken at home what languages the fathers does the father speak? Comes of the mother, uh, which is the village language, uh, as they call it. Um, what languages they speak themselves is L1. Um, whether uh, what level of education or educational attainment they have, uh, they have been educated through which language? Is it French? Is it English? Uh, any other? Uh, the full list is available uh, in uh, the Corpus Download and includes other things like, for instance. When did you speak Fiji first? Mm -hmm. A lot of them are, you know, uh, first uh, uh, first language speaking speakers, but some others are not. Um, in the new version, uh, the new release uh, of the corpus, we're going to have uh, speaking ID codes, which are uh, what I showed you uh, before. There, All right? So speaker numbers in the participant files, which is you know a big table essentially matches the um, speaker ID in the actual text, in the actual corpus files. Mm -hmm. And the speaker ID is a composite of uh, uh, variables uh, and categories, such as the one I showed you before. So uh, our first speaker in the corpus is speaker 1. Uh, it's an anglophone male, and B tells you that it belongs in that age group, uh, category 22 to 34. Right. So, um, just when you see uh, information about um, a particular example, you can tell all of this. Mm -hmm. This hasn't released yet, it's, it's uh, a new development, as I said, but it will, it will be published in the next uh, version of that. Right, um, and this is where things tend to go wrong. I'm <laughs> um, uh, going to play you uh, a little bit of um, of the corpus. So um, again, this is from Bamenda, a uh, private dialogue. Uh, speaker 4, um, an anglophone female, uh, also of a young category. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Mommy, uh, that one a really long story. Because if first of all, the teacher would they first give me one, I know they first like me, the teacher. I know they first like me, the supervisor. Because for all my course time for level four, I they ever write that Madam you test fail. I they take na in a different section. I really passed it fine. Then I cover that year. Then for the two course them now, I get me pass mark. I validate me the course. One Madam go come class. He stand. He tell you say he no go give no note. As in the lecture, you they take your notes. You go read now. You get your own different definition for something. Uh, so man get your own different definition. When you write now, no madam the mark now the one where he say he there for your head. <coughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you go read you some of your book, you get your own different definition for that. No, he goes so so deny. 
because he never read a book and he know nothing where you did talk about. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked very closely with these texts though. So this young woman is complaining about the marks she gets for her college work because how can her tutor know whether she's got a good mark or not for her definition because they haven't read the same books. Mm. Mm. And, and uh, the, the thing that is coming through as well is that you know she seemed incredibly pissed off. <laughs> uh, I tried to convey um, it. So, you know, um, yeah, so you can feel a lot of, of, of uh, anger. Okay, um, so this is uh, essentially to give you a flavour of, um, well, ideally what you could do with the sound files, but also uh, the orthographic spellings and the uh, challenges that we've had. Um, now on to the case studies then. Okay, so um, we wanted you to see some uh, linguistic data to get your teeth into because we are the Phil Sock. Um, and so we thought we'd look a bit at grammar, a bit at Lexis and a bit at code switching. Um, and uh, under grammar we look first at closely at some particular feature of CPE which I wanted to investigate the distributional profile of the non-verbal copula which also functions as a focus particle in the language so I'll tell you a bit about that and then we want to zoom out and compare what we can see in the corpus about the grammar of CPE with some of these other databases which as we said before are not directly comparable these are standard English regional varieties not regions um, but still whether we see some patterns um, in terms of Lexis we'll have a look at some most frequent words um, in the corpora and again compare them and then Gabriel will tell you something about a code switching project um, where by combining markup information with the participant metadata you can begin to get an idea about the social meanings of uh, language use, code switching in particular. Okay so this case study I'll tell you very briefly about this. Um, I was interested because I've uh, information structure is one of my favourite things ever since I was working on Hausa, um, focus in Hausa, and I had to mention my Green 2007 book here because that was published by the Philological Society. Thanks, Phil Sock. <laughs> um, so since then and before then and until now, um, very interested in this um, idea that there's a grammaticalisation chain between uh, a copula and a focus particle and it passes through some predictable recognisable stages cross-linguistically. This is common in West African languages but cross-linguistically also common. So the idea is you start off with what I would call a true cleft which is a bi biclausal construction that has a uh, copula marking focus on a particular constituent and also contains some marker of relativization, which is the bit that makes it biclausal. And then you get a construction which many linguists would call a cleft because it's got a copula in it, but I prefer not to call a cleft because at this point it's monoclausal. So basically it's a focus fronting construction where focus is marked by the copula particle. Um, and then you get a focus fronting construction where the copula focus marker be begins to become optional. And then you get constructions where the focus marking copula distributes not just in the clause initial domain, but maybe clause medially, even clause finally. Okay. So that's a kind of pattern I was looking at. Um, and when I was working closely with the text, working on the grammar project, that was something I thought it would be realistic to investigate this, even though it's a small corpus. Because this is a very, very frequently used grammatical particle, it occurs thousands of times, even in this little data set. So I was able to get a good idea of its distributional profile. Okay, so that was, that was the why. Okay, so here's a few examples so you can get a sense of what I was looking for. So each time I saw the NAR copula, then I put my data in this Excel spreadsheet and have to code each one according to what the NAR article is doing there. You've got cleft constructions, so the naive where I did try and now so um, that's what I'm trying now. Um, where na is the focus marking copula, ye is the pronoun that's being focused there, and we is a marker of relativization. Then we also get focus fronting constructions which would look like that but without the way. Naive I can try and now so it's also possible. Then we've got three categories where na is functioning as a copula, it is a copula, a non-verbal copula, and we know it's non-verbal um, because it never co-occurs with the pre-verbal particles that mark 
tense aspect move modality negation, well no, can be negation, but those other pre-verbal particles that identify verbs in this language. So those ones I divided into three different categories. Uh, cop is a now copular clause with an overt subject and predicate, like ye name na Mary, her name is Mary. CPD, now copular clause with subject prodrop, so now bad fashion, which means it's bad behaviour or bad manners. Um, this, interestingly, is the only type of clause I have found in Cameroon Pigeon English that allows subject prodrop. Everywhere else it requires an overt subject. Uh, CPS is a now copular clause with a postposed subject, and that's very common with these demonstrative pronouns like dat and dis. Okay, not a problem, dat. Okay, and then the other category I coded at this point in the coding was where na is being used as a focus marker in a construction that is not a cleft. Okay, so it's not a copula in the sense it's not heading a copula clause and it's not focus marking in a cleft construction but it's just distributed as a focus marker in a verbal clause. Okay, and there's some examples there. This one I would have coded as in situ object focus, so arikutna, that means the na is here and it's focusing the object, okay, which occurs in its usual post-verbal position here. Yep. Okay, so grouping together the, the copular ones, um, which I did look at separately, but I just want to give you an overview here rather than go into all the details. What I found from this coding was that na occurs over half the time as a focus marker. That's 53%. Significantly more if we take into account its use in cleft constructions, which gives you another 8%. And the rest of the time, 39%, it's uh, functioning as a copula in non verbal clauses. Okay, so that suggests to me that its use as a focus marker is well established in the language, but it's still being used as a, a copula. Um, now, of the focus constructions marked by NA, this is the bottom diagram here. The overwhelming majority of those correspond to in situ focus. So not a focus fronting construction, now focus constituent, rest of the sentence, not that one. The one where now is occurring anywhere you like in the clause preceding the element that it focuses in situ, in its usual position in a declarative clause. Okay? So 68% of the time. Um, just a note here that I coded subject focus separately, so I did in situ, ex situ, and then I did subject se separately, because in a clause, in a subject initial language, whether you consider subject focus in situ or ex situ depends on your theoretical assumptions, and I wanted just to take a theory neutral uh, approach as possible, so I coded those ones separately. So, you know, you could draw your own conclusions from that. Okay. So, um, my conclusion from this quick case study is that, well, it wasn't quick when I did it, so just quick now, <laughs> um, is that the distribution of NA is consistent with the profile of an incomplete or ongoing grammaticalization chain. Um, but one of the things that we have to think about when working with the Pidgin Creole language is whether this, what looks like grammaticalization, is really grammaticalization in the sense of genuine internal language change over time, or is it what Brun calls apparent grammaticalization? Okay, so the idea behind that is this is type of substrate influence, a process that Heine and Kativa called polysemy copying. So you copy into the contact variety the beginning and end stages of a grammaticalization chain in the substrate languages, and then map those onto corresponding categories in the Pidgin Creole language. So because this grammaticalization chain is so common across linguistically, I think it's quite plausible that this is a case of apparent grammaticalization. But you know, there are lots of questions yet to be answered about um, the historical influences on Cameroon Pidgin English, what the substrates actually were, can we ever know for sure, etc. So I leave that as an open question, but just to illustrate what it's possible to do even with small data like that, if you're focusing on the distribution of grammatical particles. Yep. Uh, and, and I think that illustrates a, a very nice point. That, you know, if you have a, a small um, corpus, uh, that a small corpus would still be sufficient to study you know, very, very frequent um, um, in, um, 
patterns. And grammar uh, would be a typical uh, case. Whereas for Lexis, you need something uh, a bit uh, more um, substantial. Um, this is another case study, uh, and we're looking at uh, give that transitive. So, you know, we went to Apex, for instance, and uh, we found that um, uh, over there, uh, Cameroon Pigeon English, speakers of Cameroon Pigeon English are said to favour the uh, indirect object construction, so what we call that uh, there. Uh, so, using pho uh, to indicate uh, well, the, um, the for you bit. Um, and this is preferred over the double object constructions or doc uh, over there. Um, and the proportion that they give in, in Apex is 70 to 30. Again, Apex is um, the, the, the person who wrote this, Sandro, there. there. And uh, this is based uh, on her work uh, and on the intuition of one native speaker. One. Um, well, we don't need intuition. Uh, you know, we have a small corpus, but you know that was still got uh, got us uh, you know an answer, and this is that this exactly wrong um, <laughs> to that proportion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even in a, in a small corpus, two hundred forty thousand words, you know the, the patterns are there. This is not in, not the intuition of anyone. Mm -hmm. This is you know construction constructions that appear. Time and again, and not just one speaker, which you know, it's also possible that one speaker sort of bias all your or skews your uh, data. No, this is at least present in uh, 18 different uh, speakers. Um, this is, you know, uh, again, uh, a way of refining uh, information, uh, existing information, and in existing data sets. Uh, this is something that a purpose a new corpus can do. Um, now, taking uh, these, you know, the transitives using GIF, um, you know, we may thought, we, we may want to zoom out and compare it with, you know, uh, other languages in the region. So, Cameroon, um, uh, the corpus of Cameroon English, which is standard Cameroon English, and other, we compare that with as Nigeria, both the written and the spoken part. And um, we were trying to see whether, you know, it is to do, uh, you know, how the data that we found for Cameroon Pigeon English patterned with, you know, a written corpus and a written and a spoken corpus. And what we do, do find is that it's very little to do with the region or how close uh, to a standard variety uh, the pigeon is. What actually seems to explain this pattern is uh, the mode of communication. So both uh, the distribution of the transitives, uh, give the transitives in uh, spoken data, uh, pretty much pattern similarly, and the same is true uh, for the distribution of uh, the transitives in uh, written data. Um, this, you know, I was very surprised uh, by, but it's something worth uh, investing. In. Uh, there may be something more than just a uh, uh, reference uh, at play. Uh, right, um, we have to skip over a couple of things, I think. But, um, another of the uh, things that you can do with a corpus is just extract uh, frequent, uh, frequency information. Right? So these are, for instance, the most frequent words in the uh, spoken uh, CPE corpus. Top pho. Mm -hmm. uh, pho, uh, as I said, is... Uh, Six, nah. My so, favorite. Snap, yeah, <laughs> um, so you see, we're, we're, we're barking um, around these uh, trees, really. um, and um, you know, if you if you look at that, uh, you can see also that you know a lot of the top ones are multifunctional, so they serve more than one function. Um, fo, we mentioned that go is used as a lexical verb to go, but also as a serial go that indicates I'm going to, for instance, a future or, or irrealis. Uh, we have now, which we've seen, can be used as a verb, uh, as a psychopula, as well as a focus particle. Say could be used as a complementizer, um, uh, as well as, as a verb uh, to say. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is uh, perhaps uh, unusual, the high proportion of uh, multifunctional items in the top ten uh, 
uh, most frequent words in the um, uh, in our corpus. Uh, when we look at the tags in, in spoken CBE corpus, uh, we also find that uh, personal pronouns are the most common one, then followed by lexical verbs, and then we have the nouns. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's also quite a number of um, grammatical uh, items like uh, imperfect aspect markers uh, and monstrative determiners and articles uh, as well. Um, this is the bit where we zoom in, right? We're just looking at our own corpus. Uh, if we zoom out and compare that with um, other varieties, like you know, Eyes Nigeria, the spoken section, and the Corpus Cameroon English, the written section, we can see that um, there are differences. And perhaps the most uh, obvious one is that um, in Nigeria and Cameroon, uh, uh, the, the written component, uh, what we do find is in the top ten, there's like three different, three, four different prepositions. In Cameroon, there's only one. Um, so, of the top uh, words in, in as Nigeria, we have to, in, and of. Uh, in the other one, we have of, in, and for. Over here, there's only one. So that leaves uh, a lot more space for other information to um, appear in there. Um, okay. This is turning into the Wizard Stop Tour. Um, um, what we, uh, I wanted to tell you now is about postage. Um, The language of the, of the text is CB, and I've shown you how uh, in, where other languages uh, contribute words to it. Uh, this is indicated in the markup. Um, um, and the markup you know, follows essentially two categories, again, in keeping with, uh, with the International Corpus of English uh, guidelines, so we didn't invent this. Um, and now, if you combine uh, the markup information, uh, so foreign indigenous, with the metadata, so you know uh, the type of participant information that uh, we've uh, gathered, uh, we can sort of zoom in again on code switch. Who code switches? Who code switches the most? Is it men? Is it women? Is it young men? Is it, uh, old women? Is it anglophones? Is it francophones? Um, and also, you know, where this code switching uh, takes place more often, right? Um, there's a number of reasons why code switching can take place, and you know a lot of these reasons are simultaneous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to decide whether uh, someone is code switching because he must, because it's, it's a necessity, he doesn't have you know, the, the um, language resources at their disposal, or because they're choosing to, mm -hmm. for prestige, solidarity, or other reasons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't want to sort of present this and say, okay, oh, region explains this, so uh, gender explains code switching distribution and so on and so forth. But these are certainly patterns that are available and uh, can be investigated. Um, this is the more, you know, quantitative, you know, flexing of our muscles uh, to uh, try and locate um, recurrent patterns. What we did find, for instance, is that, uh, recall that we collected information from five, di five different uh, cities. Code switching uh, seems to correlate uh, with uh, population size. Mm -hmm. uh, in the more frequent, uh, code switching is more frequent in large metropolitan urban, grocery urban uh, areas. Um, and this goes hand in hand. Find more code switching where more people uh, are available, which tells you something about the effect that the media, as it were, has on the language. Um, we mentioned that uh, we have uh, francophones and anglophones as part of our um, corpus. Um, francophones are fewer, but still they do an awful lot more code switching than francophones. Why is that? Um, we don't know. We don't know. We can hypothesize, but you know, the type of why questions 
this type of work is not going to be able to tell us. Mm -hmm. I'll give you uh, uh, some suggestions later on. Uh, males appear to code switch proportionally more than females. Mm -hmm. That's proportionally. It's not that we have uh, an imbalanced sample. Um, and with age, well, we don't have uh, much to uh, comment here. It's inconclusive. Uh, largely because a lot, uh, some of our recordings uh, actually come from radio shows mm -hmm. and we cannot be sure of really the age of the, uh, of the speaker. Mm -hmm. right. Still, it seems to be a youngish uh, phenomenon, mm -hmm. which is uh, the younger people who tend to the most. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, when it comes to uh, the social meanings, uh, again, we have to understand that if we find code switching, you know, the presence of, of a different language in CPE, that does not mean uh, that, you know, the underlying motivation of that switch is one and the same, even within the same speaker. Um, some of the suggestions uh, that I'm going to put forward, really, are more to do with um, looking at uh, a qualitative inge investigation of the um, of our files. Mm -hmm. We asked them, we went and asked them, you know, what can you do with pidgin that you cannot do with English mm -hmm. and French? Mm -hmm. So they tell us, mm -hmm. they, they, they do very happily, um, they're very happy telling us uh, what they can do. Mm -hmm. And that in a way explains uh, the, the CPE uh, code switching. So one of the things is multilingualism. Mm -hmm. uh, mixing English, Pidgin, Sun, everything, mixing it all up, Cameroon is a bilingual country, you start speaking that. Right? Um, for these, mm -hmm. we had to sit down and read the interviews. Right? It's not a matter of sort of extracting information on means of tagging on this and the other. It's more longitudinal rather than cross-section. Um, Co switching and Pidgin in particular serves particular functions better uh, than others. Uh, so to preach the word of God to the congregation, you can use pidgin because it's nothing to lose. It allows the humble man to understand what they're saying. Um, and if you want to speak openly, if you don't want to hide anything, there's no reason for you to not use pidgin. Because everybody speaks pidgin. Um, there are some other uh, suggestions. Age. Mm. We also complain that pigeon is going to the dogs. Um, <laughs> there's a complaint tradition in, in pigeon as well. Um, at least the elderly women in the village will understand what you're saying. Uh, the youth of today, they speak only English or pigeon. They can't speak their indigenous languages. Um, and also uh, the notion of stigma, particularly if you think of that the official languages are English and French. Um, so these are you know, suggestions that might allow us to explain the patterns that we found earlier. But of course, you need more uh, data there. And this is where we're going next. Um, our next steps uh, involve um, the release of our improved version uh, of the corpus files, so that involves corrections in the orthography, uh, improvements on the markup, improvements on the uh, part of speech tag, uh, improved access to participant information data, so we're going to have better speaker IDs that uh, will give you uh, an immediate idea about who the speaker is, rather than you have to you know, find the text file and then go and check the information on a, on a big table. Um, so this is what we're working on uh, now and hopefully this is going to be released in the next three, four months. Um, the next uh, element is we're putting together a new bid for uh, a larger corpus that would allow us to, um, well, to achieve um, more variation, uh, that would allow us to gather data from uh, more speakers uh, from different locations involving more uh, Cameroonian uh, scholars. Um, and also, you know, if we're going at 1,000 words, hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, be able to comment on Lexis. A million. What is it? 1,000. 
what she said. Um, <laughs> um, and the interesting thing is that you know we've already you know we, we didn't do just one pilot, but we did a pilot and a pilot to the pilot, right? So we know where what's uh, what's going to you know crawl out of the woodwork, right? So we got a, a you know reliable tagger. We've got a spelling system, uh, we've got uh, processes for um, collecting the information, transcribing, uh, editing. Um, what we need now is some sort of, you know, massive spell checker uh, system <laughs> <laughs> that uh, will allow us to feed uh, into our, some sort of a dictionary uh, of use. Um, but essentially, we're not we, we're not creating anything new. Essentially, we're scaling up what we've already done uh, so far. So we're very confident that uh, you know, this can be done uh, quite quickly. Um, of course, this is when uh, the Republic of Amazonia, um, uh, which is the the, um, the separatists, the separatists um, are calling the the Anglophone region. So it's quite topical, it's in the news a lot, but it's also quite, um, well, dangerous <laughs> to, to travel there, and uh, not just for us, but also for uh, our colleagues who are you know, working in English-speaking universities, so they have a you know, big target uh, uh, painted on them. Um, so yes, this is, this is uh, where we are now. Do you want what, what time is it? We've got... Uh, oh, okay, time to stop then, really. Okay, so just very briefly, we outline our ongoing research strands. There's still some grammatical puzzles we'd like to solve. I can tell you more about those if you want to ask me later. Um, much more work to be done on the lexis of the language, which hopefully with a larger data set would be more practicable. Um, ongoing project on um, tone. Is, is CP a tone language or not? Um, we've done some work with a phonologist on that, that's, that's ongoing, um, and also more on code switching and the social meanings of language use. Okay, I think we can wrap it up there. Thank you.